Welcome to our monthly Voice of Supply Chain show. I am your host, Sarah Scudder. I oversee marketing for SourceDay, and our supply chain software prevents late supplier deliveries for manufacturers, which has been quite a challenge and quite a topic for conversation over the last couple of years. If you'd like more intel on what's happening in the supply chain manufacturing world, feel free to connect with me on LinkedIn, and you can follow my two hashtags, Manufacturing Maven and Women in ERP. So today, what I love about the show is so many of my close personal friends actually come on and I feel like we're just chatting and, and having a normal conversation offline. So today, one of those very special guests is Dina. I have known her for the last several years. Um, she and her family moved to the United States from Canada. I was hosting some meetup groups. I was lucky enough to have her attend one of our lunches and we've become friends and got to know her husband and family. So, so, so honored and excited to have Dina on our show today. Thank you, so, so Dina, the, the format of our show, as you know from our prep is, this is really telling your personal journey. We're going to talk about your, your path from childhood all the way through where you are today, which happens to be an entrepreneur and CEO and founder. Um, with that, for those of you that are joining live, I would like to encourage you to drop us a note in the comments, give us a shout, tell us hello. would like to know where in the world you are joining us from. And a word to describe how you are feeling today. I see Kathy Perna dropped a note, welcome to the Voice of Supply Chain show. So feel free to put comments throughout. We are also taking questions throughout the hour today. So if Dina says something that sparks a question or you wanna hear more intel on a certain subject or topic, make sure to drop those questions in the comments as well and, and I will be monitoring those. So Dina, I'm gonna make you put your thinking cap on and go back in time and we'll talk a little bit about some of your childhood memories and experiences. So what is your, what in your childhood shaped you to be the person that you are today? Let's start there. Well, yeah. Thank you for having me on the show. First of all, I'm, I'm really excited and honored to do this. And uh, it's been, it's been so amazing to, uh, to have you as a very close friend over the past few years. Um, the thing that actually um, resonated with me hard most um, is the, the concept of really hard work and sort of in-depth work ethic. My mom was one of those people who, uh, when I brought home a, a test result of 98%, she would ask, so what happened to the 2%? <laughs> and that was something that kind of stayed with me all the time. Um, not always great because uh, it kind of turned me into a bit of a perfectionist, which uh, can come with its own set of issues. Um, but as you know, uh, as I grew within my family, the one thing that was very clear is that um, they maintained a very good balance between ambition and gratitude and contentedness. And I think that is largely what got ingrained in me um, as somebody who wants to work really hard, but at the same time, someone who is always grounded in, you know, all of the great things that I already have. And, and that, that is the balance that, that they brought to my world as I was, you know, growing up. Who would you say is the most influential person from your childhood and why? Um, I have to say it was my father. Um, my, my mom and dad both graduated from um, just, you know, degrees in business and they um, immigrated, not immigrated, but moved to Dubai um, when they were younger in, in their careers. And my father was very lucky. He was an accountant before and he ended up with a CEO role as a, uh, you know, running the seven up bottling company in Dubai for a number of years. Um, and he had this incredible positivity about him. And even though it was a very daunting role to, to, to get initially and to, to sink your teeth into, he never, you know, faltered or feared. He was always kind of there and, 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 
continued to work really, really hard to, um, to prove himself in that role. Uh, but then he decided that even though he was CEO and it was a fantastic role, he wanted to build his own company. And he stepped down from that and started a small factory within uh, Dubai and then extended that across all of the Middle East. Um, starting a new company was not something people generally did when, you know, back then. And it was a very daring move on his part. Yet at the same time, it was probably the thing that gave him the most joy in life. And I watched him do all that and, and grew up with that. And it was the one thing that sort of stuck with me um, as in, you know, one day I'm going to start my own company too. And, you know, that's, that's all because of him. So I, I'd love to hear a little bit about the company that your dad started. Yeah, it was, um, it was it started up as a, um, a small factory producing toothpicks of all things. I don't know why he picked that. Um, but then he expanded that into uh, multiple things, including they were creating juices and they were creating um, insecticides and uh, bottle covers. And I used to actually go and um, I spent a lot of time at the factory after school. And I, you know, we used to love watching the the machines kind of go together and the quality control people looking at them and so on. Um, and I, I couldn't tell you why he picked those specific things, but I know he traveled the world to, you know, get the right machinery to do the right things. And I think there was some synergies between the actual manufacturing machines that did the work. So it was, uh, it was interesting. And it probably was the first, you know, the first, time I learned a little bit about, you know, supply chain and, and bringing in products and products that end up getting late or not delivered and things like that. So it's interesting, Dina, that I've come full circle in my supply chain career. And now I'm in the manufacturing space, which mm -hmm. is new for me in the last two years. So when you were talking about spending time in the factory and making the toothpicks and the products, it, it made me smile because one of the projects I'm helping coordinate is Source Day. It's called Source Dayers in the Wild. And I, I want everyone at our company to understand how a manufacturing plant works. Mm -hmm. So we're lining up tours of manufacturing plants locally. And we conducted our first two tours in the, um, the last couple of weeks at a plant called Athena Manufacturing. Mm -hmm. And it was just a really cool experience. I got to go on the first tour with a small group of front with our team. And I just was kind of in awe of the machines and, and how everything worked together and then actually turned into a finished product that ships out the door. Yeah, yeah, it is. It is actually fascinating. And especially for you know, back then I was maybe, I don't know, 15, 16, when, when I was watching it all happen. And from, from when he, you know, bought the machinery, installed the machinery, got it going. And, you know, again, all the pieces lining up together was very, very fascinating. And back then there was no 3D printers and <laughs> some of the <laughs> incredible machines I saw at the Athena manufacturing plant, they've invested heavily in automation. So robotics and None of that was around at the time when your dad launched his no, plant. Definitely not. Yeah. So what's one thing you learned as an adult that you wish you knew as a kid? It's a great question. Um, I think the thing that is most, um, most impactful to me that, and I, I, I remember it vividly when one of my bosses said to me, the world is not black and white. The world is gray. And eventually I came to terms with that. And I eventually I, I came to accept that the world is actually a beautiful collage of, you know, many different shades of gray. But when I was growing up and maybe not necessarily as a kid, but more as a teenager, I always thought of the world in terms of black and white, and it was either right or wrong, and it was either good or bad. And um, I beat myself quite a bit around things that perhaps didn't go my way, because to me, I only saw them as failures when, in fact, they were steps towards growth and you know success. 
Um, but it took it took quite a while to get to that realization. And I really wish I knew that earlier. And I feel like that realization rings even more true with, with entrepreneurs. Yes. <laughs> when you're starting something from nothing and everything falls on your plate, sometimes there is a middle ground and it's not black or white and you've got to just figure it out and do the best you can. Exactly. Exactly. And that, that I mean, it's a continuous you know, growth for me personally is, you know, to, to do exactly that, to figure out what is good enough. And, you know, another boss used to tell me, um, perfect is the enemy of good. Um, and, and I'm kind of, again, learning that good is, can sometimes be good enough and you kind of just let it out and, and start doing, you know, improving over time. Sometimes that 70 or 80% is good enough. Yes. And a hundred percent is just not feasible and it's going to set you back. So totally. something that I learned early on in my career, just because I've always worked in startups. So I think that really helped me kind of see in between the lines a lot younger than most people. Mm -hmm. So Dina, one of the things that I didn't know about you until we were prepping for the show today is that you, I think you're a singer as well, but you conducted a youth choir for over 20 years, which is fascinating to me. So I'd love to have you just talk a little bit about that and maybe an experience that you have that you could share and, and maybe some learnings from, from running a youth choir. Yeah. I mean, I was barely a youth myself. I had just, I was like 21 when I started that. And, um, and it was it was a fantastic experience, one of the best in my life. We had about eventually we we grew to become about 60, 70 people in the in the group. We started with like 10 or something. And uh, it was more of a hobby, and then we turned it into something a little bit more than that. But the the corollary between that and just even running a company is is uncanny in terms of, you know what I learned running that choir in terms of trying to understand, you know, everybody's capabilities, everybody's talent, everybody's, you know, vocal, uh, you know, levels and things like that. Um, and working as a team, doing things that um, we have to work as a team because otherwise our harmonies are just going to be ridiculously bad. Um, one of the experiences that I will never forget is, um, and, and, and the other thing is actually finding talent and convincing somebody that they actually have amazing talent that they're not seeing and being able to show them that and, and give them enough confidence to get out and, and, and maybe sing a solo or something. And I had uh, one of our, our group members, um, she was prepping for a song that was really, really hard and it was going to be, you know, uh, presented to uh, the entire congregation and um, it was a very special occasion and she was so afraid that she was almost on the verge of kind of backing away from it um, but eventually I talked her into it and she trusted me and we worked together on it and um, she delivered the performance not only perfectly but to incredible applause that people asked for an encore and we actually had to run the song again um, because, you know, people loved it so much and she did such an awesome job with it. Um, and that person today actually created her own uh, youth choir that is even bigger than the one that we had. And it's, you know, today running across all of the GTA. Uh, so it's, it's that, you know, giving people the confidence and, and, and encouraging them and telling them, showing them the best in themselves and allowing them to become the best of who they can be, I think is a, is a huge thing that I took away and, and that I implement everywhere I go. Now, are you a singer? Uh, no, I would not consider myself a vocalist. I, I can work with, with the, with the vocal vocalists, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't say I'm a singer. I was going to ask for a, a, I was going to put in a song request next. So <laughs> you said no. <laughs> nope. <laughs> so you grew up in a, a, a very disciplined entrepreneurial business focused family. I'm curious, what did you do after graduating high school? I'd like to hear a little bit about your educational journey. 
Yeah, after high school, uh, well, I, I, I graduated in Dubai. And at the time I graduated, Dubai was not the Dubai that it is today. It was very small and they did not have a single university there. And um, I had, I was given a choice by my parents to either go to an American university in the US or go to the American university in Cairo, uh, which is where I was born. Um, so I decided to go to the American university in Cairo because I had you know, cousins and other people there that were, uh, you know, we were a close knit family. So I figured, you know, I'll, I'll stay where I have people that I knew. And uh, I studied um, economics and computer science, graduated with both degrees. Um, and then shortly after that, I came to Canada. Um, I, we immigrated as a family to Canada. So you worked at a bank in Canada for what I would consider a very long time to be at one place. I, I want to say, I think it was like 22 plus years. So tell me about this journey of, of immigrating to a new country and getting a job in procurement, essentially, or, or data or supply chain. Yeah, um, it was a very long long journey um you, you know you you graduate with these amazing ideas and and the zeal of the world that you're going to go and conquer the world and reality sets in pretty quickly especially when you immigrate and especially for me as a female and you know um, someone new in a new country i knew i needed to work really really hard and it was a great opportunity to join the bank um i started actually not not near procurement at all. I started in the bank as a business analyst and I was very lucky to have had the opportunity to be there at the right time when you know the internet was booming, uh, financial services was starting to put out products for online users. And um, realizing that I quickly taught myself a design, you know, graphic design and HTML coding and a bunch of other things that positioned me really well to, in addition to being a business analyst, to actually working on the product that the bank was uh, rolling out uh, for the first time, and that was the online securities trading pro uh, product, so like online online trading. And um, so I, I was the sole person that kind of built the product for that. Um, when you say built, meaning you were actually coding and programming? Yeah, I was coding uh, the front end. I was creating the designs, um, doing all the mock-ups, and then everything went over to the engineering team who then actually put the real, you know, the back-end code to it. But I did the whole front-end part, um, which was, I mean, it was enormous learning um, and, and all, all, also a lot of fun. Um, I mean, I'd, I graduated with computer science, so I knew all about coding, but I didn't know HTML. So that was the one thing that I had to sort of teach myself. Um, and then, you know, over time, the bank bought E-Trade Canada, and I learned a lot from the product team that joined uh, with that acquisition and, you know, eventually started the, the, you know, building out the product team for the wealth management uh, division and ultimately had a team of about 85 people that were running product for all external users that uh, came to the platform. I think we had about a million users every day um, and all of the internal users that uh, use products within global wealth management at the bank, um, about maybe 1500 users. So so you were kind of in, in my world, I would consider that more like a chief product officer type role. You could, you could call it. I mean, it wasn't that up there. It was just head of product, but yes, the, the, the same concept. Um, but through that, um, because the bank did not have a procurement central central led procurement team, they did not have a central led third party risk management or anything. I mean, those things came much later. Um, I did all those things as part of leading product because we had to we had to work with a lot of suppliers um, and you know for the research and data and a bunch of other things. So through that, I just by rote, actually just figured out how to work with suppliers, what to look out for, what to be careful about and things like that. Um, and kind of somehow fell into procurement and supply chain quite coincidentally when 
my boss, who I reported to for a long time, actually left the wealth team and went to work over in the CFO organization and just came knocking and said, you know what, can you help us with, you know, you know a little bit about suppliers and you know a little bit about negotiation and working with suppliers, whatever. Can you help, you know, the bank wants to set up a third party risk management program and maybe you can work with us on that. And quite frankly, initially I said, no, I said, I'm like, I don't know how to do that. How, how am I going to do that? And um, and he convinced me that I had it in me. And I guess, you know, this is one of the, one of the times when it's good to have somebody that sees something in you that you don't see in yourself. Um, and uh, and I did. I, I went and it was probably one of the most amazing, challenging, beautiful experiences of my life where I got to build this whole program for third party risk management. Um, with a few, you know, regulatory issues hanging in the balance that we had to, we had to deal with and, and fix and so on. So, Dina, some of those that are with us today, or people that will be listening to this afterwards, may not work at organizations big enough to have a third-party risk management team. What is that, and and kind of what are the, some of the main functions that this team or this type of position does? Mm-hmm. So. In, a, in very simplistic terms, the the whole idea of having a third party risk group or function is is to make sure that your ecosystem of suppliers are um, nurtured in a way and examined in a way that will not add risk to your own organization. Um, in you know in more recent years, and I'm talking like the last I don't know 10, 15 years. Uh, with the with the advent of cloud computing and so on, um, the ecosystem of suppliers has grown tremendously for any given company. In the past, companies built their own whatever they needed. So they'll just, you know, they need something, they build it. They had massive um, IT organizations that did that for them. And it was all contained within the company, so it wasn't risky. It was part of the company. In, in, you know, in today's world, that has changed dramatically, whereby every company focuses on their main, you know, area of focus and hires outside companies to do anything and everything that is not part of their main focus, which I think is, is a lot more efficient and, and a much better way of doing business. But that also introduces a level of risk in that you don't control every single supplier that you work with, even though you are incredibly dependent on them uh, for for you to be able to supply, you know, whatever you need to do for your own customer base. And that is where that whole concept of you need to know the suppliers, really understand what they do and how they do it, um, understand what kind of risk they could potentially introduce, learn more about their financial viability, learn about um, their cybersecurity standards, um, in many cases, especially when it comes to financial services, there are regulatory obligations to doing certain things in certain ways so that you're you're managing your, your supply base. So those are all different components of building that um, risk management program. In financial services, there's a very specific you know, framework that the regulators uh, deploy called the three lines of defense, which is part of what I built. Yeah, I mean, you're in about as regulated of an industry as you could yeah. get, so... Yeah. yeah, not everyone is in such a regulated space, yeah. but I would argue, given what happened the last couple of years with COVID in particular, if if a company doesn't have some sort of risk management program, it needs to be a priority this year. Absolutely, a hundred percent. And not not having that is um, can be deadly for organizations, unfortunately, especially smaller ones. So what actually is happening now is that companies are self-regulating. So even though there is no you know, regulator breathing down their neck necessarily, um, depending on what business they're in, they are regulating themselves by making sure that they are creating that function within their teams. If you had to pick one or two of the most important things to have a successful risk management program in 2023, what would it be? Um, <clears throat> when you say things, uh, what do you mean? Are you talking about practices or um, things to look out for? What? I would say practices, processes. If, mm -hmm. if I'm building something new or don't have a very built out program, 
what sh- what should I focus on and really prioritize over everything else? Yeah. Um, thinking about not only the onboarding, because a lot of people think about onboarding and everybody thinks about on- onboarding. That's, you know, that's obviously the door, but it's not the end. I think the concept of making sure that there is continuous monitoring happening um, is probably the single most important thing. And I mean, if we've learned anything from what happened with SVB the other day is it, it wasn't watched. Like it just, it the, the whole thing just collapsed. Uh, and it it was seemingly out of nowhere, but when you dig deeper, there were problems percolating behind the scenes that people didn't see. So having that as much visibility into what is going on in your supplier's world on a constant basis, especially you know your top tier suppliers or those that are most critical to your business is, is paramount. So I host a show called Manufacturing Woes and I bring, most of the people come from a supply chain or operations background and they share their train wreck stories. So the mm-hmm. craziest things they've lived through in manufacturing. And it was interesting, the theme of last year, if I had to say kind of what what most of the guests talked about or brought up, was the fact that they wish they didn't rely on a single supplier for essential parts and materials. And they all had done major scrambling and have prioritized having multiple suppliers. So for me, I know that that's a, a big part of a risk management program is having backup. A hundred percent. Redundancy is super important. And even in our own startup, even though we're so small, um, right from the beginning, when we're looking at data sources or at, you know, whatever else we're doing, we're almost doubling up on every single data source because of exactly that. It's like, okay, if this goes away, what's, you know, what's our backup? Yeah. So you were at the the bank for, like I mentioned, uh, just over 22 years. You served in several different roles. You left running the, um, I'm not even sure what your title was, VP of risk. Okay. Mm-hmm. Um, so you decided, you and the family decided to move to the United States and the Bay Area. So talk to me a little bit about that decision-making process. Yeah. Um. <laughs> quite frankly, in some ways, a part of it at least was was made for us. Um, our children both graduated, they're four years apart, but they tended up tended to take the same career route. And they both graduated from a business school in Toronto that was um, recruiters came from uh, all over the world to recruit from that school because it was a very prominent school. And um, they both happened to get recruited into Goldman Sachs uh, TMT department here in San Francisco. So it was okay, they came, okay, mama, it's just gonna be, you know, a couple of months, we're gonna do a summer here. And, you know, that was it, because I was like, really scared. I was like, oh, you're going to, you're going to you know, a different country and so on. Uh, but anyways, so they ended up uh, doing whatever it was, the two, three month um, internship, followed by a, a, a full time offer to come back and work, you know, at Goldman Sachs full time. And of course, I mean, that was an opportunity neither of them could could um, uh, move away from. And uh, they both accepted. And again, four years apart, but it happened to both of them. Um, and they came and stayed here and met their significant others here. And it was kind of, it became their world. And um, it was kind of difficult for for my husband and I to just all of a sudden have an empty nest with them being so far away. Um, but at the same time, and very coincidentally, I, I was running the procurement team at Scotia by that point. And we happened to be sourcing um, a business spend management platform and happened to meet with the Coupa team. And I was super impressed with the company, the leadership, their values, their, you know, how they conducted their sale, and of course, their product. Um, and at the end of the day, we, we ended up sourcing that into, into Scotiabank because it was the right product for, for the bank at the time. And uh, about a year or so later, um, they were looking for a CPO uh, to come kind of had the, uh, their first CPO uh, requirement. 
And uh, I ended up, um, you know, putting my name in the hat and here I am. <laughs> it just, uh, it was, it was a, a wonderful combination of, you know, a great opportunity at a great company that had just, you know, gone public. Uh, obviously a fantastic role. It was a move up in my career and very close to my family, my children. The moons could not align better. So, and I want to acknowledge one of the listeners, um, we had some questions come in and I, I will make sure that uh, we get to, to those questions um, at, at the right time in the conversation a little bit later. So thank you for submitting those questions. Continue to submit questions if things come up. And again, if you haven't yet introduced yourself, t- give us a shout, tell us where you're joining from and a word to describe how you are feeling today. So, Dina, you were the chief procurement officer at a supply sell side company, right? So a little bit different than a lot of our listeners. And you were their first CPO, which is um, fun and challenging all at the same time. I've had first in my career where you're kind of creating your own job description as you go. <laughs> So what what did you do as the CPO? I'd, I'd like to start there and then talk about, you know, some of the mistakes you made and some of the learnings um, that you gleaned from that experience. Yeah, um, it was it was incredible and challenging, like you said, and interesting all at the same time. Um, they used to call me the barber's barber because I was a chief procurement officer in a procurement company. And it was, it was quite, you know, the internal joke. Um, so in addition to the normal function of a CPO, which is building a strategic sourcing, um, function within, within the group, um, I, you know, I was trying to do that to your point, you know, creating my own job description along the way. Um, And I only had one team member. So I went from, you know, massive organization, large group to uh, a very, you know, relatively lean group. And I think when I met you, you may have been actually hiring that person. (laughs) Yeah, it was uh, uh, when I when I went, there was one person there um, and I was trying to hire a second, which eventually happened uh, later, later on. Um, but during, during the time there, it was, it was the one person. So it was, um, the, the biggest challenge I think was the trying to break between, you know, the strategic component of, of sourcing and the tactical things around just negotiating every, you know, day-to-day contracts. Uh, of course, other components of my role, and that was discussed right before I joined was, you know, in addition to, to being a CPO for this company, um, the company sells into CPOs, so, or procurement leaders in general. So part of my role included, you know, interfacing with those procurement leaders and maybe going out on some sales calls with a few of the, of the sales teams, depending on kind of when they're doing enterprise sales, especially in financial services. That was kind of my, my area of expertise. Uh, Also in some ways supporting the, um, the, the, product team. So when they were creating some parts of product, they would come to me to, you know, provide some opinion around how a, how a procurement leader would be using those tools. Uh, also working with the marketing team to uh, help with, you know, some specific messages um, that are directed uh, in, in particular to procurement. So it was it was all everything and, and anything you can think of um, playing different, different, you know, small pieces in in a lot of different roles and um part of it also was the fact that through my tenure there Coupa acquired I can't remember now maybe five or six different companies um in a very short period of time so part of that was okay how do we figure out how do we roll out all of these new products um into the organization internally so um there was a lot going on and when you're talking about what are my learnings and, you know, what could I have done better, perhaps prioritize a little bit better. I think there was a level of overwhelming that was happening with all of the different pieces of what the role entailed. Um, so what I took away was incredible learning relative to how a nimble, fast growing company operates. Um, 
Rob Bernstein, the CEO of Coupa, is an incredible leader. I admire him tremendously. And, you know, the values he created in the organization and, and following and actually living those values is something that I, you know, I am trying to emulate in my own new company right now. So I, I think I've seen him speak twice now in person, mm -hmm. uh, at one at a SIG conference. And it, it's really interesting to hear his story and journey and being the CEO of a, at that time, public company mm -hmm. is not easy. And I, I don't think people realize how much stress and pressure he was living under every day. <laughs> Yet he, he didn't. Um, he didn't let that bleed over onto the teams, which is, again, a, a huge, um, you know, uh, I tip my hat to that tremendously because, you know, I think part of being a successful leader is being able to sometimes shelter the team from, um, from some of the things that you're going through. And, and he did that really, really well. So you stayed at Coupa, I think it was over a year. Um, um a couple of years. Yeah. A little, a little less than two years. Okay. And what are you doing now? Yeah. So, uh, I, um, after I left Coupa, I was thinking a lot about, um, third party risk and how, how it's managed today and what we can do with technology to make it better. Um, I had some ideas and, I knew AI was going to be a huge um, catalyst in in helping companies uh, manage risk. Um, I'm a I'm a huge proponent of data and kind of factual knowledge as opposed to um, you know arbitrary or ad hoc information. So um, I took a bit of a hiatus after Coupa, and I actually um, I joined uh, a program in MIT to learn more about um, AI and specifically AI for business and so on. And, uh, and then went on to establish Halo AI, where we are uh, focused on um, supplier risk management in a way that is holistic and that is rooted in rich and connected data. So largely what we do is we help companies derive intelligence from, uh, from thousands of data points um, that we connect together. Um, and using AI, we can come up with insights that then drive action relative to uh, kind of what, what needs to happen next. So my, my marketing brain that likes things very clear and simple mm -hmm. would, would recap that to say if somebody's setting up a supplier risk program you have software that may be able to help glean insights on the suppliers is that correct that is that is exactly it um the the idea is that we obtain data from a whole host of different sources and we pull it all together we come up with you know supplier scores and our value proposition, if you will, is, you know, threefold, really. One is um, having this machine learning intelligence that just from the data from the outside, we're able to evaluate and quantify the risk that any given supplier might bring to a company. Um, one example of that is, um, let's say, for financial, for, for private companies. The financial data is hardly available. It's very difficult to get financial data for private companies. Yet there are a ton of private companies that are amazing companies and doing great things. And, you know, people should be working with them as suppliers. Um, so instead of relying solely on their financials, for example, we look at a whole bunch of other things that they have that are working for them. And then we balance that with, you know, across all of the different information that we know to then provide a score that a company can rely on to say, oh, yeah, um, even though their financials may not be, you know, well known and perhaps even not great, 
um, they are, there's still all these other things working for them and therefore they're good. It, it reminds me a little bit, the, the model is a little bit like, you know, how Credit Karma and Experian are now helping, you know, immigrants and people who didn't have credit in the past build credit. It's kind of a similar thing. That's just one example. Um, we also build workflows that use um, things like natural language processing and others to be able to um, ingest the data and push it into um, sort of the, the responses to questionnaires. So instead of people entering data, they're now reviewing data, which cuts the process from months to, to minutes. Um, and then lastly, we look at compliance. That's a big part of what we do. And we look at the differential between where somebody is and where the compliance or the regulatory standards are, whether they're InfoSec or actual regulatory. Um, and we provide the gap and, and a step-by-step and -step guidance to get from point A to point B. So how far along are you in the startup journey? When, when did you officially launch the new company? Yeah, we launched in uh, 2020, August 2020 was uh, our official kind of date. We started actual operations in 2021, January. Um, and we've been building since then. Uh, we officially came to market about, I'm going to say four or five months ago, like at the beginning of this year, uh, where we started actually getting out to customers, having design partners and kind of working with, with the world on the outside. Hardest part about launching a startup? Um, <clears throat> keeping your positive outlook. It is an incredible uh, roller coaster. And it can be very lonely. Uh, because to some degree, you, you want to shield your team from the ups and downs and the ups are very, very high and the lows are very, very low and um, it can be really daunting. So keeping keeping that balance and being able to stay positive um, can be hard. Um, but, you know, there are some things that I try to do to, to stay sane. <laughs> What's something that you didn't expect that you actually really like about having a startup? <clears throat> uh, something I didn't expect. Hmm. I'm not sure. Um, I like everything about the startup. And I don't know that anything I, I didn't necessarily expect. I didn't, I didn't expect I would be able to, to pull off um, staying sane for this long and being staying resilient, I should say. Um, I love every aspect of it, even even the lows. And even though they can be really rough, um, especially, you know, when you're trying to raise funds or trying to sell into a company and you feel you're getting so close and then it doesn't exactly happen. Um, these things can be really hard. But out of every one of them, it's like, OK, what are the learnings? What am I going to bring into the next discussion and I try to move on. And that's, you know, that's been a lifeline for me. I, so a lot of my friends are entrepreneurs mm -hmm. and have their own companies. And I think one of the things that I notice about my friends that have had companies for a while is people don't realize how hard sales and marketing is until you have to do it yourself. A hundred percent. I have so much respect for salespeople now <laughs> and marketing. Um, and I still don't do those things very well. I try my best. I'm learning. Um, you know, the, the, the best part about entrepreneurship, quite honestly, is the whole learning part. Um, everything I've done in my career to this date has just positioned me for what I'm doing today. But I find myself that I every single day there's something new that I'm learning. And that in and of itself, I think, is a huge motivator to keep going. But yes, sales and marketing are so incredibly difficult. The other thing that I've I've seen through watching so many of my friends struggle with their own companies is figuring out where to invest your money is hard. Uh, yes, <laughs> and time. It's actually both. Um, 
because prioritization is incredibly important. And the only resources you have at this stage are maybe a little bit of money and a very little bit of time. And between those two, um, trying to prioritize where what is most important can be a juggling act. And sometimes you make mistakes. And I know I, I've had my my share of, you know, making mistakes on prioritizing things on both fronts um, that I probably looking back now should have maybe done more of that or less of that. So Dina, we've, we've got a, some questions um, that have come in from the audience. So I wanna make sure we, we have time to get to some of them. Uh, this one is, what are the major risks to watch out for in 2023 for a startup in procurement and supply chain? Fantastic question. Um, I think what's happening in the world right now is that there is a lot of um, procurement and supply chain was not a big thing, I don't know, seven, 10 years ago. Um, a lot of people have now clued into how, uh, how important and how valuable this function is. And there's a lot of uh, companies and technology that's coming into the the, the world around that. So it is it is becoming a very, um, I don't want to say saturated, but there's a lot of different people doing a lot of great stuff. And I think the best and the most important thing is to figure out your niche and stick with that. Um, and it's okay to, to, you know, to, vert, to divert here or there, but I think knowing exactly what is your differentiating factor and really doubling down on that is the most important thing. Otherwise, um, it would be it would be risky because you could get washed um, in in the shuffle. Mm -hmm. Another question that came in is around AI, since part of your solution is AI driven, and and you have some experience in AI. Is um, people are are getting really overwhelmed with so much coming at them. That's AI speak or AI talk. How do you prioritize and even navigate the world of AI right now? Yeah, um, I think for us, the most important thing is that we are taking it one step at a time. So when we started the product, we started it completely rules-based and then moved into certain elements of AI that can take us from rules-based into producing um, AI-driven models um, that still have a human in the loop to some degree. We're now moving into utilization of neural networks and deep, net deep learning and things like that that are um, a lot more involved but it's very much a step-by-step-by-step -by -step -by -step process. I think the, the most important thing is to understand exactly what problem are you trying to solve for? What data do you have and how much of it do you have? And which form of AI will get you to where you need to go? To your point, there are a number of different elements and, and there's more you know, newer models coming in every day and keeping an eye on the goal is I think the most important thing. And then you work backwards from there. So in the marketing space, in my world, AI is, is going to have a really big impact and I'm excited about it. So I, I myself and my team use ChatGBT3 right now and we're using it to help with research. So if we have a topic or subject we want to write something on or host a show on, we can type prompts in and it will go out and gather information very quickly for us, which is, which is very useful. But what I wanted to share was in March of this year, I attended a social media conference in San Diego and they had a phenomenal speaker on AI. Hmm. And he showed us, he pulled up on the screen, a prompt that he typed in on chat GBT3. And it was about writing a funny and humorous out of office email response for him because he was traveling, speaking at the conference. Hmm. So he did the prompt in the version three, showed us the result. 
And then he did the exact same prompt in version four. And it was a night and day difference. Yeah. Yeah. Version four is incredible. It, it's it's going to change the world. <laughs> and I, I think my take on it, other than I'm super excited about it and I'm embracing it, is that learn enough about AI so you know how to use it and you can automate things in your job or you will get passed by. You cannot be afraid of it. And if I just encourage people to really, really spend the time to learn how to use it, learn how to understand it because it's, it's here to stay. And I just hate to see people, you know, push back enough. And at some point their jobs could become obsolete if they're not willing and able to use AI. Completely, 100%. And it's not, so the way I think about AI is that AI does all of the things that in many cases we as humans, you know, we don't like to do. Like there's a lot of things, especially when it comes to, you know, the part that we're working on, there's a lot of things that are monotonous and repetitive and answering all these massive long questionnaires. You know, I don't need to have to do that 50 times a day if I'm a supplier trying to respond to whatever. Um, I can rely on somebody else's models that will allow me to pull all, all the data and and then I can do the things that are way more um, sort of require much, much higher level of intelligence as humans, as opposed to, you know, doing the mundane things. Now, with chat GPT-4, I think it's coming a little closer and closer to being, you know, the real intelligence that I'm sure the 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 originators of AI had been dreaming of, um, but it still won't get to a level. It, it's still at the end of the day, irrespective of all what's happening with you know the, the explosion of ChatGPT, it is really pulling data that already exists in anywhere in the internet, and it's kind of bringing it all together. And yes, in a very intelligent way, um, but the reality is that it doesn't create something from nothing. So humans will continue to be required to create something from nothing. And that is something AI cannot ever do. Um, and that I think is, is why there, there should not be people who are afraid of AI to your point. It's just, how do I use it? How, how do I empower myself to, to get ahead and actually then free my brain and time and everything else to create something from nothing? Mm -hmm. So, um, Dina, what's next for your business? I mean, you're you're three years old, but you're you're still very much a startup, and you started probably at one of the most difficult times you could ever launch a company. I think the world shut down <laughs> right after your launch. This is so lucky, huh? <laughs> um, so, what's next for us is um, we we're continuing to build and continuing to. Uh, really work on our product market fit when it comes to the particular niche that we chose, which is looking after supplier risk and supplier management in general, um, based in data. So we were starting to work with uh, a few large companies as design partners to help us with um, better, you know, understanding their needs, making sure that we're creating the product that they would love to use. And that is actually going to make their lives a lot easier um, and just continue to expand the goal. You know, the, the long term vision is to um, to to turn Halo AI into, you know, like what I like to think as the, the sales force for risk and compliance management relative to third parties. Hefty goal. Yes. <laughs> you got to have one because otherwise you can't wake up every morning to keep going. <laughs> so I always like to close out the show with a spitfire round. So I'm going to ask you a, a few questions and you'll respond with the first word or phrase that comes to mind. Okay. Accomplishment you are most proud of. Establishing handle AI. Quality you admire most in yourself. Resilience, perseverance. Favorite TV personality. David Attenborough. What's your dream? Um, 
to continue to grow the company to become, you know, the, the, the most valuable product that somebody could use to manage their risk and compliance um, and to become a grandma someday soon. <laughs> Biggest pet peeve. Um, when I talk to somebody that is distracted by a phone or a kid or something like that. I, I can relate. I, I have a story that I'll share with you another time about. That is also one of my biggest pet peeves. Yeah. <laughs> Favorite thing to do in your downtime? Um, walking slash hiking anywhere near the ocean or any body of water. Bucket list item you're going to check off this year? This year. Um make my dad feel better. He's had, uh, he's, he's had some struggles over the past few years and uh, we're looking forward to a medical procedure that he's going to do that is going to change his life. So I'm really excited about that. And what are you binging? I don't have time to binge, honestly. <laughs> Outside of just reading and, and making sure I'm keeping up with what's going on in the world, not a whole lot more. So if you have an extra 30 minutes and you can't sleep and you want something super positive and uplifting and just makes you feel happy about the world, I highly recommend Ted Lasso on Apple. Oh, that's right. I actually did watch that. I'm not binging it, but I, I am watching it. I watch it once in a while and it is a great program. All right, so this brings us to the end of another episode of Voice of Supply Chain. A big thank you to Dina. I recommend reaching out to her on LinkedIn, checking out their website, following what their startup is doing with all, all the big plans they have in store. We will be back again next month on May 17th at 1 p.m. Central. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sarah.